0.5%. Um, and if, if a farmer has bailed the hay too soon, then they can look forward to, in about six weeks' time, a nice barn fire. Usually between two to four weeks, but normally in week four or five, the hay is fermented to a certain extent that uh, it's getting very close to ignition temperature. Okay, next slide, please. Mm. Come on. There we go. Thank you. That's just a bit of a look forward to. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a case study as well. <clears throat> that's not me. That's a gentleman, a local surveyor in Spain who goes by the amazing name, a fantastic name of Geronimo. I worked with him on a job uh, out there some time ago. Thanks, Chris. Next slide, please. And I just thought I put things into perspective. This, this is data that was in, some of you will remember, this is in, I think, October, Seaway magazine. Some stats there about fire losses in the uh, shipping industry. We, we have uh, Allianz to, to um, thank for this data. It's, it works out something like 47,000 claims per year, and still at 18%, one of the most expensive uh, losses in terms of uh, shipping that's uh, subject of fire. I mean, it's uh, statistics like this are quite interesting because um, sadly, some time ago, I was dealing with a, an incident where, where six, six seafarers lost their lives on a tanker in the Caspian Sea and got me thinking in terms of uh, there is no central depository for uh, fire stats or fire injuries in the shipping industry. So that's something that uh, perhaps we can uh, need to look at in the future, but that's uh, another subject. Thanks, Chris. So what are we going to be doing this morning? Well, I'm going to be talking about self-eating, what, what it is, some of the signs and symptoms, uh, how do we monitor, and some simple do's and don'ts. Thanks, Chris. So these are the sort of cargoes susceptible to uh, self-eating. Um, Seed cakes probably, which is a food cargo, and I'll explain a bit more about food cargoes in the next slide, but seed cake probably takes up most of my time. So it's probably about 70% of self-eating fires. Uh, wood pellets, uh, coal is probably the, the second subject. I'm just back from a job in Bangladesh, the coal, problematic coal cargo. And <clears throat> I must admit, in the six years I've been doing this job, I've not had any uh, DRI jobs. So that's just a bit of a, a flavor in terms of where these jobs actually, what sort of cargoes these jobs actually occur in. Thanks, Chris. Now, this is an extract from the IMSBC code, the International Maritime Solid Belt Code. This is, these are food cargoes referred to as seed cake. Probably in terms of volume of trade, you would be surprised, like soya, rice, maize, uh, probably um, most common cargoes. But actually, uh, I'll just mention rice. I had a job in Mexico about uh, four weeks ago, which is very unusual. Uh, rice is sort of has a very low oil content, so we don't get um, uh, many self-eating uh, fires in rice cargoes. But we had one, uh, let's say, three or four weeks ago. It was quite interesting. We suspect that the cargo somehow or other got very wet prior to loading. Now, um, the MSBC code splits these cargoes into three categories, type A, B, or C. Um, type A, the cargoes that are likely to liquefy and give you some stability problems. Type B, uh, what we class as hazardous cargoes. Type C, is the cargo is neither likely to liquefy or considered hazardous for the crew. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so what is self-eating? Well, we get uh, a reaction. These are either fermentation or oxidation. We get an increase in temperature. This builds up due to the thermal qualities of the, the cargo. And this just uh, keeps accelerating because basically it cannot dissipate the heat faster than it accelerates. And we eventually get to auto ignition temperature, which generally is around about the 280, 300 degrees Celsius. And the next slide, we'll look at some of the mechanics. <clears throat> so 
sorry, I'm jumped ahead one day. Just a quick diagram here, thanks to the Swedish club. Um, it's just a bit of a simplification, really. We have the product there, and we have some uh, uh, moisture and oxygen, and then we we're getting some uh, product of of heat after to uh, react with the product. Next slide, please. Okay, so we start off with the sort of microbiology. I don't profess to be a microbiologist, but I understand that uh, the sort of bacteria gets excited. And when we've got some moisture, we've got some um, organic product. And this normally takes us up to around about the 50 degrees, 60 degrees Celsius. About that point, the bacteria is killed off and the chemistry tends to take over. Now, once we've got beyond about 50 or 60, we get a doubling of the reaction rate with every increase of 10 degrees Celsius. So as the reaction rate increases, we get an increased heat production. Now, the bulk mass prevents that heat from dissipating. Uh, it's particularly bad if you've got lots of fines, a very dusty cargo, lots of fines in it. So the heat will build up quicker and we eventually reach our addition point. Now, you look to the right hand side there, there's some soybeans there gives you an indication that uh, discoloration of cargo can be a bit of a clue, and, and we'll we'll touch on that in, in a second. Thank you, Chris. Now, I refer to this as the sort of <clears throat> the five pillars of self-heating, if you like. Uh, we take any one of these pillars away, we can uh, frustrate the process. We start at the top there with moisture. Uh, if you look at your um, uh, IMSBC code, uh, it'll give you lots of information in terms of how the cargo, you know, what sort of spec the cargo should be, how it should be loaded, in what weather conditions, and how things like, you know, the trim, uh, other hazards, and how the problem, how the cargo should be ventilated. So if we can make sure the cargo is on spec and the moisture content is low, that can uh, frustrate self-heating. Clearly, with the fuel, <clears throat> as long as the fuel is present, any biomass will generate heat. Now, I've had problem cargoes in the past where you might be in a port where a bulk carrier is being discharged with what you call these continuous ship unloaders. Now, they normally have a, a tripping mechanism in them that will cut out a sort of 60, 65 degrees Celsius if the cargo is too hot. Now, some people have suggested that the vessel should go out to anchorage, to an anchorage, and you know, sit there with hatch covers open, let the cargo cool down. That's the worst thing you could do because once you've got self-heating, once the cargo has gone hot, if you sit out there with the hatch covers open, they give you plenty of oxygen. It's only one direction that temperature is going to go. If you've got a cargo that's too hot, it has to be discharged. Now, if you can't discharge it through the normal process because the shore side facilities will, will not want a hot cargo going along their conveyor belt, for instance, then you've got to find a different way of discharging. This cargo needs to get off and out of the hold onto shore side and be spread out shore side to let the cargo cool down naturally. Uh, moving around to heat, um, holds, especially if they're uh, near the engine room or you've got some um, uh, heated fuel tanks, you've got a, the chief engineer is going to be carefully watching his temperatures. You know, the, normally tanks are run between 25 and 28 degrees Celsius. We've had many a uh, problem cargo where when we delve into the records, we've had the fuel tank running far too hot. And that's encouraged um, self-heating the hold. Time, I had a job not that long ago uh, where a vessel had been hijacked with pirates with the cargo. And it was sitting there for many weeks, getting hotter and hotter and hotter. But clearly, the longer the cargo is in the hold, the more challenging is going to be in terms of frustrating the self-heating process. Oxygen, we need real good uh, sealed hatch covers to limit the amount of oxygen. If we've got poor seal or we've got, uh, you know, ventilation windows not sealed properly, too much oxygen in the hold, it's not good for self-heating. Once the cargo starts to self-heat, we need to batten that uh, hole down as best as we can. The, uh, the least amount of oxygen, the more it will frustrate the process. 
Thanks, Chris. And you should play a quick video here. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, this was a cargo that had been loaded in Indonesia. Would you believe it? This cargo was in the hole, and um, we were contacted by the owners for some advice. Clearly, the cargo is way off spec. It shouldn't be loaded um, more than 55 degrees Celsius. So we, we could we advise the, the, the owners that this cargo needs to be discharged as soon as possible. Uh, the charters obviously were insisting that the cargo was fine and was within specification. Uh, we sent a local surveyor to the yard where the cargo had originated, and lo and behold, there was huge masses of this stuff steaming away with people standing on it with, with hose pipes trying to cool this down. You know, making the cargo wet was, was going to be the worst thing you needed to be spread out. The heat could be dissipated. So uh, in the end, the vessel had to discharge its cargo and um, reload a cargo that was within spec. So that would have been a very dangerous cargo to commence any voyage with. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> okay, some of the signs of self-eating. Um, we saw earlier some, some soybeans, so discol discoloration of cargo, a bit of, bit of a clue. Um, whole cargo temperatures. Now, uh, generally, you know what temperature the cargo was uh, at uh, the load port. And we use some um, sounding pipes to get an indication of what's going in there. Now, clearly, a sounding pipe is only going to give you a temperature at the extremities of, of the stow. You don't know what's going to be happening deep within the stow. Um, I've seen surveyors co commonly use these, uh, these infrared thermometers to get a reading on the surface of the temperature and quite often they stand on the, um, the hatch combings and doing doing it but actually if you look at these actual the specs of the gun you need to be actually very close to get a, an accurate temperature but my food colleagues in CWA they tend to use these two meter long uh, temperature probes I mean two meters doesn't go very far into the stove but it gives you a much more accurate indication of what's hap happening within the, the cargo uh, carbon monoxide readings are very useful. I will be covering whole environment shortly. If you get an increase in, in carbon monoxide over a steady period, then that's an indication that you've got a potential problem cargo. Odour is another uh, another useful clue, and clearly visible smoke is a clear indication that there's something not quite right within that hold. Thanks, Chris. So we measure the temperature of the cargo through whole sounding pipes, usually at the three levels. Um, modern vessels now have got uh, whole temperature facilities. They've also got gas sampling ports. Uh, so we can use the probe on the gas detector. Most, uh, all vessels now will carry gas detectors. I would probably do that at four hour intervals. And we build up a, a picture throughout the passage in terms of what's happening within that hole. Thanks, Chris. Now, this is a, a typical hole monitoring form. I think this is a vessel I attended in Alexandria. She had a fire in a fumigated cargo in hold three, I think it was. Um, you'll see in the top right, uh, the sort of uh, hole quantities and the sort of temperature that the cargo was loaded at. Then if you move down to the middle of the page, you've got along the top there, all the different fields in terms of uh, gas readings, temperatures, facility there because it's fumigated cargo, there's facility there for the um, phos phosphite tube readings um, because I think she was uh, fumigated with aluminium phosphide, gives you phosphine gas. So and as you go along there, you'll see uh, temperature, cargo temperatures, and you can see there ventilation closed. This was a fumigated cargo, so there would have been no, no ventilating throughout the voyage. 
Thanks, Chris. Now, these are sort of the gases that we're particularly interested in. Hydrogen sulfur doesn't tend to trouble us too much, but the three main gases that give us a good picture are the oxygen content, the carbon monoxide, and the hydrocarbon, the uh, methane. We, talk, we measure LEL in percentage terms. Now, if you've got an increase in carbon monoxide over a steady period and a decrease in oxygen, that tells you you've got a potential self heating cargo. Also gives you a good indication that your hatch covers are nicely sealed. Um, if you get a rise in carbon monoxide and the oxygen level doesn't decrease, that tells you you've got a problem with the hatch covers not properly sealed. And clearly, to manage a self heating cargo, you do need effective uh, hatch covers. We're also interested in the uh, hydrocarbon because um, we'll obviously want to reduce the amount of explosive gases in the hold. Now, this is the challenge, really. If you've got us in, in particular, say, if you've got a dealing with a problem coal cargo, so you, the likely scenario is you're getting uh, high carbon monoxide readings, oxygen levels decreasing, you're getting increased methane levels. So then there's a trade off between uh, ventilating and not ventilating. Generally, with self heating cargoes, you do not ventilate because you want to keep the oxygen content as low as possible. The lower the oxygen content, you reduce the rate of combustion. But clearly, if you've got a self heating cargo and you've got elevated uh, methane levels, that is a very dangerous situation. So we need to ventilate. And um, ventilating will always trump uh, not ventilating if you've got elevated methane levels. Now, <clears throat> the problem is once oxygen goes below 10 or 12%, the gas detectors on board get very unreliable because they use what you call catalytic pellisters in the, um, in the gas detector. Now, a catalytic, catalytic pellister needs oxygen to function. So as you go down to 12, 10% oxygen, they're not very accurate. So sometimes there's a bit of a, a challenge where you're trying to advise the owner remotely and you know the readings you, you've been given are not that accurate. So we tend to try and build a picture over a period of the voyage just to sort of get a handle of what's happening. And quite often the CWA, if we have a problem cargo, we will get those whole monitoring forms in on a sort of three or four times a day and we're asked to sort of uh, have a look at the data and uh, advise the owners whether they should ventilate or, you know, what they should do if there's a proper potential self-eating cargo. Now, in terms of um, low oxygen content, there, there are other gas detectors that can detect hydrocarbon in low oxygen concentrations. They tend to be used infrared pellets, but they're very, very expensive. And sadly, ships tend not to, not to carry them. So we have to make do with, with what we've got. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just a quick reminder for those who've not looked at the gas monitor for a long time, there's sort of uh, four fields there. And just a quick note, uh, carbon monoxide, people don't realise this is flammable. Um, you have to, it's got a 12% lower explosive limit. So you, you, you do need quite a lot of it in your hold, 120,000 ppm. Um, but um, you very rarely get to those sort of levels, but just people don't tend to realise that carbon monoxide is actually flammable gas. Thanks, Chris. These are some occupational exposure limits. Um, there's a lot, it's been a, it's been a lot of work in the industry in terms of conf confined space procedures. Sadly, seafarers are still losing their lives because they're not going through the correct procedure while entering a confined space. But these are sort of uh, limits, you know, you're entering a hold, problem hold, uh, which there will be carbon monoxide and there will be methane. So it gives you an indication of you know, what, what, what is safe or what is unsafe. You've got an eight hour TWA there of 20 parts per million for carbon monoxide and the short term exposure limit is normally 15 minutes. It's 100 ppm. I certainly wouldn't be going into a hold even for five minutes at those sort of levels. But just, just, just an indication there of the safe exposure, uh, workplace exposure limits. And we're going to talk a bit more now about some um, lower explosion, lower explosive limits and the upper explosion limits. You see there in the centre there, we've got a window uh, uh, of a flammable envelope between five 
and 15%. But what we measure on a ship, uh, we are measuring 100% LEL. So we're only measuring from 0% to 5% volume in air. Now, the first action level uh, is at 1% volume in air, which is 20% LEL on the gas detector. So once your gas detector is recording 20%, that's your first action level. And that, in fact, gives the master a five-fold safety margin in terms of buildup of flammable gas. If you get up to 100% LEL, you have now reached the lower explosive limits and it's getting into dangerous territory. Thanks, Chris. And some simple do's and don'ts. Um, you'd be surprised how many masters uh, open hatch cover when they think they've got a, a fire in the hole just to have a look, just to satisfy themselves that they've got a problem. We advise masters, if you think you've got a problem, do not open your hatch covers. Keep everything nice and tight. Um, don't have anybody enter the hole. Get your boundary cooling equipment ready. Uh, start consulting your PNI clubs. Um, make sure you've got a good uh, history of your hold and gas data so we can assist you in determining exactly what's going on and um, if the vessel is is so fitted uh, prepare your CO2 or inert gas and that uh, concludes my brief history on self-heating and we're going to move on now to a little case study uh, this is quite interesting because uh, as I take you through it you'll see that things don't quite fit in the normal pattern uh, that you'd expect in, in such a, an incident. Bit of background, the vessel loaded in uh, the Baltic. Uh, she loaded Russian and molasses sugar beet pellets. Awful weather during loading. The, the, the log was showing uh, hatch covers closing and uh, opening frequently due to the inclement weather. Uh, port of discharge was uh, Seville by the Kiel Canal. And she stopped briefly in the canal for a, a quick crew change, had some bunkers, and it's an 11 day passage with very bad weather once she passed a shunt into the Bay of Biscay. Uh, that was the intended passage, but actually, as soon as she rounded a shunt, she ended up uh, dodging some bad weather in the Bay of Biscay for a couple of days. Now, interestingly, um, during the two days between Lat uh, Latvia, by Pea and uh, Kiel Canal, the master noticed a very unusual odour. And he wasn't sure because they'd never carried this cargo before, but there was a very, very strong, pungent odour coming from the hold. And amusingly, um, they, were, they were doing crew change in uh, Kiel Canal, but picking up a, a replacement chief engineer. And the chief engineer made, <laughs> replied to me that... Uh, he commented to me that uh, he, he he smelled the ship before he saw the ship uh, as he was waiting for her on the berth. So something unusual is happening in the holes pr pretty early on in the voyage. Thanks, Chris. Uh, this is a um, close-up of the uh, sugar beet pellets. Um, now, these uh, have had the sugar extracted and they're very high digestible fiber apparently very good for horse feeds and it, it's described as a high energy low protein uh product it's a type c cargo so it's not uh liable to liquefy or it's not fast as hazardous and um being a type c cargo the vessel wouldn't ordinarily have required a co2 fitted hold but luckily, on this occasion, we did have CO2 fitted. Thanks, Chris. So when she arrived <coughs> at uh, Seville, as they were opening the hatch covers, they were astonished. As soon as the hatch cover was opened, they were astonished to see a severely blackened cargo. The top, probably top six inches of the cargo was absolutely burnt to a crisp. The underside of the hatch covers was severely damaged by heat. The paint was just hanging off the hatch covers, top sides, severely burned. And there's a small amount of smoke emitting from the cargo aft. Now, this is at 11 o'clock. 
so this generated a lot of phone calls and and obviously there's there's a lot of uh, concern it, it they they had not noticed the thing throughout the voyage this particular cargo hadn't required any monitoring by the charter uh, the ship actually didn't have any uh facilities for men for uh, no hole sounding pipes no gas sampling ports and she was taking a lot of seas over the decks during the the, the passage and obviously she had very very good uh hat seals because they didn't smell any smoke i didn't see any smoke um so they were astonished to be presented with this scenario of a completely burnt cargo they, had, they were very shocked so uh, nothing much happened until one o'clock when all of a sudden flames became visible over a distance of four meters. Now, so what's happened in that two hour interval is as the cargo had uh, ignited in the hold, it, it had consumed all of the oxygen until it, you entered what's called a vitiated atmosphere. And that is that is fire burning in an area where in an environment where it's low in oxygen now once the oxygen level goes below 16 percent you will not get free flaming you will get smoldering you'll get combustion back down to one or two percent oxygen but clearly the lower the oxygen rate the slower the uh reaction of, of combustion rate so what's happened here as this cargo has now been exposed to the atmosphere the oxygen content to slowly build up but once it's got beyond 16 percent we have now flames so initial fire finding by the crew the local fire rescue service was summoned and uh they attended did some firefighting and then instructed the master to close hatch covers and prepare for a co2 discharge that's a quick photo of the vessel and um, right, so here is a photograph of the vessel's uh, CO2 room. Now, um, under the FSS code, um, a vessel is required to be able to discharge um, by volume 30% of the largest cargo space. So you need enough CO2 on board to fill 30% of your largest cargo space. Now, the regs require that gas to be able to two thirds of the gas to be discharged into the hold within 20 minutes. Now, if you're talking on a um, container vessel, that's, that's, that goes down to 10 minutes. And if you're talking machinery spaces, you require 85% of that gas within two minutes. So we're looking here at a situation where uh, we needed 30% of this gas to be in the hold within 20 minutes. Now the hold was fitted with two CO2 nozzles, one on the port side, one on the starboard side. Um, so just quickly, uh, why do we use CO2? Well, it's very good at um, displacing the oxygen in the hold. It's very good at permeating through the cargo. It doesn't affect the stability. It very rarely affects the actual cargo itself. The disadvantages are is that it's not it doesn't have a very good cooling effect, even though paradoxically it's coming out of that discharge nozzle at minus 60 or 70 degrees. It's not a very good uh, co cooling gas. So if you open your hatch covers too soon, there's a really strong chance of reignition. When I when I get jobs with CO2, you know, we quite often have hatch covers closed, but for days, you know, 72, 90, uh, 76, 96 hours, whatever, 72, 96 hours. Three or four days and even then sometimes when we open the hatch covers we still have some hot spots very rarely does everything go according to plan with the co2 discharge quite often crews will do drills but they very rarely do it for real the mast in question here been at sea 30 years never used co2 in anger and quite often things go wrong things like you find out where, where valves freeze over hoses burst uh, chief engineer, even though they go through the drills, when well, they do it for real, but the wrong valves are, are open and the CO2 gas goes to the wrong compartment. Those are the sort of things that, that happen quite often. Next slide, please, Chris. On this occasion, um, 
you just see there that the pipes have been actually removed. But those high pressure pipes have fed the nozzle on the starboard side. As soon as they cracked up in the CO2, this, this hose here burst. So half the gas just discharged into air and only half the CO2 went in on the port side. Now, even though they'd only had half the gas in, for some reason, the local unseen fire commander instructed the master to open the hatch covers again after 45 minutes. And as expected, the cargo reignited. So we then had some more practical firefighting. Funny enough, while I was while I was there, I was just looking across the other side of the harbour and I could see another vessel discharging obviously what was a problematic cargo. I couldn't quite make out what the cargo was, but clearly there was an issue with it. So um just goes to show how uh, how uh, common these problems are. That's an indication of once the top layer had gone, the cargo looked quite quite in good condition. Although there was some concern about um, smoke taint, because quite often livestock won't eat if it, if the cargo has been tainted by smoke. And there's an indication of, of the sort of the heat levels, the blistered paintwork, top sides of the cargo, and you can see you know the paint's gone right into the steelwork. Thanks, Chris. Now you can see as the cargo is being discharged, the, the point of origin is starting to emerge. And we can see the origins of the self-heating there. Thanks, Chris. Uh, there's another view there, the, the heat and smoke damage to the hull. You have to go to dry dock after, after this job and another complete re repaint job. There's some sugar beet pellets uh, burned to a crisp. Hold lighting, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. There was a suggestion by the charters that the owner Owners were at fault because the hold lighting had been left on. We were able to prove that that wasn't the case. Thanks, Chris. Uh, there was also paper in the stove, which was uh, a bit of an issue. And uh, uh, there were other areas of the cargo that, were, that had been caked. And um, I'll elaborate further on that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a second. And we can see the burn pattern there. That's about three meter wide. Uh, Burn pattern there, and you can see as, as the smoke's going up towards the top of the hole. Next slide, please. And this is the seat of the fire, the actual, what I call the cake. This is where uh, I mentioned earlier that the vessel had been loaded in inclement weather. And what we suspect happened was in the actual port, the, the product, the actual sugar beet was arriving by railroad. Rail wagons were unloaded into trucks. Trucks were then driven to the vessel, discharged into hopper, finally into the vessel. Whilst the vessel was very diligent in keeping the hatch covers closed, because under the IMSPC code, it clearly states this, this cargo would not to be loaded in clement weather. I don't think the, um, the rail workers, the lorry drivers and the stevedores were as diligent. And what we suspect happened is one parcel of the cargo was, was loaded wet into the hold. I've got a nice cake structure there. Next slide, please, Chris. Now you can see the relationship between the fire and the hold lighting. We were able to prove to the owners that, um, in fact, the lighting was uh, had a two-stage process. There was a, a key and a switch, and only the master held the key. We were able to show that the hold light had been uh, extinguished because they were frustrating the um, crane drivers at the load port. And also you can see there, the seat of fire is some distance below the hold lighting. And <clears throat> there was also a suggestion that um, the uh, heated fuel tanks had been the cause of the fire. Charter was insisting that the owner was at fault. We were able to show that um, the fuel levels uh, when the vessel sailed were substantially lower uh, on the day I was in, I, I attended the vessel, you can just see the 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 line there, the top of the surveyor's head there. That was the fuel level at um, twenty seven tons, and on the time of the fire, it was considerably lower at seventeen tons. So, so that was uh, at one point eight meters. The fuel level was at twenty seven tons. The fire was at two and a half meters, but actually on the day the, day the vessel sailed, 
it was substantially lower than that. So to prove that the fuel tank levels were much lower than the seat of the fire. Uh, thank you, Chris. That concludes my presentation and thank you for listening. Wow. Well, thank you so much indeed for that, Colin. Um, uh, I'll open the floor in a second for questions. I've got one straight away, actually, for you, if I may. I'm looking at that picture there. Let's say the seat of the fire had been much lower near the deck. What would be the risk of heat transfer into the fuel tank and an exacerbation of the problem? Is that, is, does that happen? Well, that does happen. And and what the, the, the sort of gut reaction is that masters uh first thing to do is to tell the chief engineer to to empty the tank uh, and uh, that's the wrong that's the wrong <laughs> thing to do because an empty fuel tank being subjected to excessive mm -hmm. heat is much more dangerous than a full fuel tank what you do is you keep the tank full and you keep recirculating it to dissipate the heat right wow i don't think we were ever taught that sort of stuff <laughs> um Colin, it's a fascinating subject and quite scary. I'm glad I'm not having to face these issues any longer. Uh, anybody got any questions? I think there's only a few of us online. We can probably unmute and ask a question direct rather than use the chat box. So if anybody's got any questions, fire away. Tony. Hi, Chris. Yeah, back in the good old days when I was in Palm, I mean, we used to load Palm kernels from West Africa to Liverpool <clears throat> in bags. And we used to have the devil's own job to stop the dockies from smoking oh, while they were yeah. discharging the cargo. And we used to yeah. get all sorts of abuse if we said, do you mind not smoking, you know? I mean, a lot of them threatened to walk off the ship and God help you if they did, because you, the officer, was at fault. They had no, they had no conception of the danger. And the cargo was very, very warm, of course, coming from yeah. West Africa. Luckily, Nothing, nothing ever happened. Uh, in the list that you had of com combustibles, I missed, I didn't manage to read it off. Did you mention swarf at all? That used to be a cargo that was quite dangerous at one time. Swarf, metal, metal shavings. Yeah, no. yes, um, that is a dangerous cargo. Not so much for, for um, it's not in the seed cake list because obviously it's not a food product, but metal swarf is is a dangerous cow and, and can be susceptible to self-eating. You're right. Yes, yeah, so I never carried I mean, swarf, but uh, you uh, know. Your point about smoking in the hole, that reminds me, uh, 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 well, two things really. One, as a, as a very young third mate, being in La Havre, having huge rows with the stevedores because they're continuously smoking in the hole and, and threatening, as you say, to walk off. Who, who was I, this young upstart deck officer telling them what to do, whatever. Exactly. And, and, and last week I was in uh, Chittagong, a uh, problem cargo, and uh, we had a fire in, in the whole five, and, and Steve Adels was smoking, and I was I was there remonstrating uh, with, with him, you know, telling him to stop smoking, whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing problem. Yeah, and of course, you, I'm a junior officer. I was second officer there. God help you if they walked off. You were the bad guy, you know. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, Chris. I have to go. I've been called away somewhere. But that was very enjoyable, very interesting. Thank you indeed, Tony. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else got any comments or stories from their own career that um, they'd like to share with us? Hello. I, uh, yes, yes Mike. Let's I go to Mike. Hello. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, if you don't mind, Colin, slightly off a subject, because you're talking about bulk cargoes, what, how much do you have to do now with sort of container issues, container fires, and also sort of uh, car carrier fires? And you, you mentioned 18% earlier on of fire claims. What percentage of these others are not bulk carriers? Yes, uh, a lot of my work uh, is containers, and I've uh, just dealt with two um, car, car carrying jobs, and I'm, and I'm probably going to go to arbitration on one in, in January. I haven't got the actual percentage figures, because I mentioned earlier, um, Allianz have done some work there, and it's not clear. that these were, This was data that was shared in Sea Waste magazine, and I, I'm not sure with that data whether those are 
Allianz figures or whether the entire industry figures. It's a it's a bit of a devil of a job trying that it isn't a central repository for stats in terms of worldwide shipping. And something I, I started looking into ooh, about a year ago, but um, time really has prevented me from, from spending too much time in trying to you know get a handle on it really. So yeah, I do work on container jobs. Um, last year, funny enough, um, and there was one in the press recently. I ended up um, investigating a job in Jebel Ali where the, the, the Iranians clearly thought this this vessel had been Israeli owned previously, but she was no longer Israeli owned. The Iranians clearly thought she had been, so they, she she was hit by a missile just aft of the bridge port side, and I ended up in Jebel Ali doing a survey on. The containers had been hit by the missile, and the the, and the 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 shrapnel on the bridge was unbelievable. How anyone wasn't killed, I don't know. But sadly, about ten days later, another vessel, the I think they used a drone, they exploded a device right on the bridge, killed the master and a security guard. So, it was, you know, very worrying trend there in the Persian Gulf. Wow. Yeah. Paul, I no. see your hand up. Was that was uh, did David? Did you have a question first? Oh, yeah, I used to act uh, quite a lot for um, cargo underwriters, and we used to be involved with corn gluten coming from America. Oh, yeah. We knew yeah. certain times of the year we would have hot cargoes, and it actually didn't affect the ship too much, although the temperatures were pretty high. Yeah. But we were grabbing it out, that cooled it, so that was fine. Then months later in the shed at Seaforth, yeah, it was like a volcano in there. Yeah, yeah really yeah. glowing. And the only way to do it was they do the drill, go in with your shovels and dig it out. So you're right yeah. about the time factor. It doesn't always materialize right away, but they were well geared to it. Every year we knew this and and uh, yeah. that was fine. So yeah, interesting talk anyway. And it's fascinating that all the points you raise, I've seen a lot of them with animal feed. So thank mm. you very much. Paul. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so I only have, have a, a quick question, really. Uh, obviously, the ship's master is, is responsible for taking on the cargoes through the IMVC code. Uh, and my question is, how is he expected to actually ensure control over the parcels of cargoes which arrive at the ship? Well, yes, it's very difficult. I mean, um, I was uh, uh, attended this, this job uh, in, I think, the, the case study I'm referring to, I, I attended it in I think it was January 2018, and then two years later, you know, a uh, potential appearance in the Madrid court, and uh, uh, the 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 legal people are trying to uh, get me to criticise the master. You know, why didn't he open hatch covers when he was in Brunsbuttel? And if he'd opened hatch covers, then you know, this fire wouldn't wouldn't have occurred. Uh, I was trying to explain. Well, hang on a minute. If it had opened hatch covers, he would have made the situation worse because he would have refreshed the by now depleted oxygen levels. The seat of the fire was from six meters below the level of the stove. How would you have seen anything at that point? So you're right. Everyone's always looking to blame the master. Mm -hmm. uh, it's impossible, really. I mean, you rely a lot on the cargo information you get, but quite often, you know, the cargo information you get, they they they're given is inaccurate mm -hmm. in terms of the moisture content, the oil content. Yeah. In terms of technology, uh, in terms of technology, Colin, uh, uh, as I, I, I speak as a labor, although I have carried bulk cargoes, but I don't think we ever overheated like that. But surely there could be some sort of device. You say that there are probes that will do death, <laughs> to take temperatures at death. Isn't there some sort of device that could be inserted in bulk carrier holes or general cargo holes for that matter, as the cargo is being loaded? So that you're constantly monitoring temperatures at various spots throughout the ship. No, there, there isn't, Chris. But what, how they get around it is they employ a company, a local <laughs> company like SGS, mm. and they will do spot sampling as the cargo is being loaded. So you're doing spot sampling at different times, different layers as the different parcels come in. So then you've got a range of of um, measurements to protect to protect the owner. Really, uh, you know, should anything occurred during the voyage well, why on earth don't they put a scaffolding pipe down into through the, you know into the into the hold and and just put some probes in there i mean it seems yeah, to me so that you're only getting then at the extremity you, you know yeah when you measure from there right to the middle of the stove it's not good shit not gonna you, work you, 
you, you're a good 12, 15, 20 metres from the middle of the stove there. So it's not going to give you an accurate indication of what's happening deep within the stove. Gosh. Anybody else got any... Uh... I, 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 I could just make a, if I could just make a comment on the container business, in the very early days of containerization on the trades I was involved with, uh, we, we, we had a, a fire superintendent, and one thing he assured me was that there'd be no need to worry about fire in containers, uh, because containers would simply snuff out the oxygen, where if there was a fire started, it would, the oxygen would burn, and uh, as a result, would uh, the, the, the combustion would take place. And it's just interesting to see how uh, how wrong he was. I mean, that was yes. the very early days, but uh, it was certainly sort of put through that containerization would, in fact, put a stop to fires on board ship in their car in cargoes. Well, you what, have what four air vents anyway in each container, so uh, yeah. they yeah. all have them. <laughs> what is um, what is scary? Of course, now you know, and there's been many uh, NI conferences on, on fires and container ships, and, and we're still looking at um, you know ways of overcoming this. We've designed ships now, and since of these these large container vessels, knowingly that, that if there's a fire, we, we're not gonna be able to put them out. Mm -hmm. And and the crew levels are such such that there's no chance that the crew can do a concerted firefighting attack. Mm -hmm. We problem. had a very interesting presentation a few months ago, and I know other grants have done that you've had one in Plymouth, I think, as well on the lithium battery EV fires. Yes. Yeah. Uh, our vice, our chairman elect, Adrian Scales, whom you probably know, uh, at um, Brooks Bell in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting presentation, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, there, the fire, I mean, they've even submerged the flipping things and they still they still yep. burn. So I had a job in, I had a job in Singapore, um, container vessel, and a 9,000 CU container vessel, caught fire off Vietnam and um, we eventually got the container ashore. It was a uh, classic container mis misdeclaration. It was listed as mobile phone accessories and it was all lithium ion batteries, which are ignited. Uh, <laughs> uh, obviously that's slightly off beam to, from today's yeah. presentation, which was about self-heating cargoes, but there's a, there's a very, very close link nevertheless, is there not? Anybody got yeah. any more questions? Well, there must be a close link there, mustn't there? Because, I mean, yeah. some con containers are carrying bulk cargoes. Absolutely. Colin, you'll need to unmute. You, you're muted, Colin. Colin, you're muted. Colin? Ah, uh, yeah, we've got you now, I think. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, actually, um, maybe a little bit off topic, but um, I don't think so. Um, here we are on a ship with limited number of crew members and um, who will have to be qualified up to, the, up to the eyeballs, metaphorically speaking, passing this course, that course, and so on and so forth. A ship arrives in a port and hundreds of strangers walk on board with no qualifications, no checks. And we've had a couple of reports of the in incidents in Bangladesh where Steve and Dawes are threatening to walk off if they're not allowed to smoke in the hold. So we are talking about a complete imbalance between uh, people <clears throat> involved with these cargoes. Now, to, ch to, to change regulations worldwide to make sure people who come on board the ship, and not only stevedores, others as well, um, should be suitably trained and qualified. Um, Probably it sounds like an outrageous suggestion, but some of these things would be stopped, would be prevented if uh, people were more knowledgeable. And um, not really connected to what I just said, but I remember when I was chief mate on a big Roro cargo and passenger Roro ship and um, all sorts of um, uh, passenger cars, uh, um, um, tractor trailers and so on, roaring on and off the ship and we just left and i was doing some rounds on the vehicle decks and there were these the driver and his mate sitting on the deck at the rear of their vehicle i won't say where, where these uh, drivers or the vehicle was from and they got an open flame stove <laughs> a camping stove on the deck cooking their meal 
Now, it is not their fault. No one had ever said, who should say, no, 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 no. How do you regulate that sort of situation? Anyway, they were perfectly amenable and doused the flames and let their, their, their tea sort of lukewarm. Um, but, I didn't uh, reach for a fire extinguisher, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that unkind. <laughs> um, so it all no. ends well, but I mention that because it shows that there's this huge vacuum mm. dealing with people who come on board the ship to work cargo or people who even just come on board with paperwork. If they don't understand, if they do not know, have not been taught about the dangers, yeah. I, it's, I rest my it's, interesting, it's interesting the point you raised, because I was in Bangladesh la, last week on a return on you Sunday, said. and I was in, in, hold, in hold five of this vessel last Friday. There's been a fire in the hold, and um, cargo, there was cargo of steel, anthracite, and these bags of PVC resin. Now, the steel had been loaded on top. Of the other bad cargo, everything was caked with a thick layer of tar smoke. And so we got the steel out, and the consignees wouldn't accept the steel, so that had to be loaded on deck. And there was, and that that was a separate discussion that went on for about a week in terms of compensation they were looking for. So all the other cargoes had, been, had, had had steel, and the stevedores had discharged, no problem at all. They, they were the only PPE they had were, were gloves in discharging the steel. That's the, no hard hats, no safety shoes, nothing. So when it came to discharging the rest of this, this cargo in hole five, they, the stevedores refused to enter because they said they wanted safety shoes because obviously they're walking on this filthy, filthy cargo. So the, 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 uh, the cargo supervisor said to the master, can you provide safety shoes? I'm like, well, no, I haven't got safety shoes. So in the end, they, so the, the old cargo were going to stop. Now I was desperate for these guys to keep going because I needed, you know, when you're doing a fire investigation, it's a bit like an archaeological dig as you're going lower and lower and lay, peeling back the layers starts to reveal more and more evidence. So I was, I was I was trying not to show my frustration because everything had come to a halt. But then the the, the chief officer, of a Vietnamese guy, managed to find two old pairs of shoes or somewhere from the crew and... Um, we managed to get the cargo work going again, but just a small example of how mm -hmm. everything can come to a halt through, through something as simple as a pair of safety shoes. Exactly. Colin, we're just about out of time, and um, so I'm going to wrap things up now. And what we'll do is, I, I started the recording slightly late. Sorry about that, but we will post the recording, and I'll I'll send the uh, the link round to everybody. Uh, but on behalf of the Northwest England and North Wales branch. I'd just like to offer a hearty vote of thanks for a truly informative and interesting discussion and presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Colin, on our behalf, and uh, I wish you very well, well in the future. And I hope it's not so bad next time you're in Bangladesh. <laughs> um, looking ahead, um, we, we, we've got an unconfirmed um, webinar planned for the 15th of December. Um, I'm still waiting for confirmation, but it's one of Ian Matheson, Captain Matheson's colleagues from Germany. We're hoping that he's going to present for us, um, but I'll, I'll circulate details of that when, when we get something confirmed. And then looking into next year, because we'll, we'll skip into next year after that, um, we're going to start this or going to try to have a, a panel discussion in March where we invite four or five different people to present just for five minutes, between five and six minutes on a, on a specific topic. And the topic we've chosen for March is carbon neutral um, policies. So if you are in a company or in a ship or in an organization or a college or anywhere else that is involved with introducing carbon neutral policies or carbon reduction policies, we want to get into the detail. We know the big picture stuff. We've had lots and lots of discussions about the big picture and global warming and so on what we want to do now is drill down into detail what are you actually doing what carbon are you managing to save how much does it cost is there any retraining involved re-education so it's the detail now what are people actually doing on the ground to reduce their carbon um, emissions and if anybody's got anything on that and say every organization 
or each each person on the panel of course could have say five or six minutes saying what they've done and then we'll uh, we'll open it up for discussion after that so if anybody wants to participate in that please let me know and we'd be delighted to hear from you and then after that looking ahead to the spring and looking at the weather today that's going to be a nice thought looking ahead to the spring we will be doing something in Fleetwood again in May and anybody that can get across to Fleetwood for, for that. And it'll be a, 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 a fantastic event again with lots of cadets, lots of experts, and we'll end up uh, having a pint or two at the end of the evening, which just wraps it all up nicely. So thank you gentlemen once more for attending and I'll see you in December, if not before. Thank you. Bye -bye thank Thanks you very much. Time. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Mm -hmm. Cheers now. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.